We acknowledge the Yuggera and Ghana nations as traditional custodians of the land on which we work, live and learn, and their continuing connection with the land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their elders past and present. All content related to this program is for general informational purposes only and contains stories and discussion around mental health that may be disturbing to some listeners. If you are concerned about yourself or someone you know, please seek professional and individual advice and support. More details are contained in our show notes. It's 8.15. Traffic is heavy on the northern approach to the city, so watch out for those bottlenecks as you enter the CBD. As promised, we've got Deflector with us this morning to tell us about the new film Captain Camouflage and the Shield of Invisibility. Welcome, Deflector. Thanks. Great to be here. Oops. (laughs) We still need to calibrate. (laughs) In case you hadn't guessed, we've got Deflector wired up to our trusty lie detector for a bit of fun this morning. While we have a chat about the film. Another super release from the Team Generica franchise to take us as far away from reality as possible. And that's never a bad thing, is it? No, not at all. Oh, our little machine's just raring to go. Should we just get going? Sure, let's do this. Whose lie is it anyway? Okay, a couple of questions. First, to warm up. Did Mm -hmm. you have breakfast this morning? Yes. Do you play the lead character in the film Captain Camouflage and the Shield of Invisibility? Yes. Fantastic. Let's play. Did you enjoy making this film? Yeah, I had a ball. Oh, really? Uh, sorry, you didn't enjoy making it. Oh, um, well, you know, there's always moments here and there you think back on and you do differently, you know? Fair enough. It's not always a case of black and white, hey? <laughs> now, there's been some hot gossip floating around about you and the leading lady. Did you two mm. get it on while filming? <laughs> no, I can safely say we did not. <laughs> I guess your wife might have had something to say about that, hey? I'm pretty sure she would. So there was nobody else on set you fancied? Uh, no. Oh, uh, hey! <laughs> really? No, 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 really. Maybe we should move on. Things seem to be going really well for you at the moment. You must feel like you're on top of the world. Yeah, totally. I couldn't be happier. Oh, really? What's really happening, Deflector? Well, okay, I'm going to be honest. Okay, so I I just haven't been getting great sleep lately. Is that all that's going on? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I've got a lot on my mind at the moment. Life must be pretty hectic with your new superstar lifestyle. Yes, definitely. So these thoughts that are keeping you awake... Any exciting ideas floating around for the next project? I've got a few ideas floating around. I don't want to put you on the spot, but what kind of plans are you hatching? Uh, It's mainly really thoughts about upcoming auditions. (coughs) And notes my director gave me on set for the movie. And how grateful I am for everything that's being thrown at me right now. Um, do you want to clarify any of that? Like, what's being thrown at you? Just all the great opportunities. (coughs) Exclusive invitations. (coughs) Fine. I'm just struggling a bit with the success at the moment. That's kind of normal, I suppose, for someone who's shot to stardom like you have recently. But you're okay, yeah? Yeah, yeah, I'm fine. Something tells me you might not be as well as you're making out. Are you really okay? Mm. No, not really, to be honest. It, it, It all kind of gets a bit too much sometimes. There are rumours around there was an issue around your contract for the film. Has that got anything to do with it? No. Um, so is it the contract that's the problem or the rumours? I can't talk about my contract. It's strictly confidential. Fair enough. Obviously lots swimming around in your head there. Everything good at home with Mrs Deflector? Yeah. Couldn't be better. Um... (sighs) Look... It's just not the happiest of times for us at the moment. We're both really busy and hardly see each other. Uh, Okay, fuck. All we do is fight at the moment and we're sleeping in separate beds. Are you happy? Have you got the scoop you wanted? Hey, 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 it's just a game. None of this is serious. (laughs) Do you, um, 
Can we stop this now? I'm feeling a bit exposed. Oh, sure we can. Honesty sometimes packs a punch we're not ready for. Hey, maybe we can have you back another time for another game. Would you like that? Yep, absolutely. Love to. That question, how are you? They don't want to know the answer. And chances are we don't actually want to tell them. Hey, Andy, how are you today? This is Reframe of Mind. Hmm, that wasn't an answer. The podcast that cuts through the platitudes and gets to the core of living authentically, challenging our assumptions and improving mental health with the guidance of good science, philosophy and learning from other people's lived experiences. We're your hosts, Andy Leroy and Louise Poole. No, no, really, how are you? We talk about how you are in this podcast. That's all we've talked about for 13, 12 <laughs> episodes so far now, Andy. How are you? Yeah. Look, you know what? I am good. I am good. Thank you. Um, I, as we'll kind of unfurl during this episode, I used to get triggered by certain things that I no longer get triggered by. And if I do get triggered by them, not quite so much or in the quite the same ways. So um, I'm, I am good. Thank you. How are you? Um, I'm, I'm, I'm good at the moment, actually. I think things are... Are you? Oh, God, the lie detector! <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go on. Have we become human lie detectors in this series? <laughs> Do you know, I sit down, when I sit down with my psychologist, every time, every time I've seen her, and I must have seen her like 30, 40 times now, I go in, I sit down, and she's like, how are you? I go, good, thanks. And then I sit down, and she goes, no, how are you? Ah. Oh. <laughs> and that's what you're paying for. <laughs> <laughs> because we are so used to deflecting and not actually telling people how we really feel. And I think there's a few reasons for that. One part of it is... People don't really want to know the answer to the question when they ask. It's just a pleasantry. And I think the mm. other thing is that we don't want to tell people how we really feel. We are we spend a lot of time minimising how we feel so we don't have to admit it, whether it's to ourselves or anybody else. You know, I think a big part of that also is kind of how we sometimes wander through life, you know, how prepared we feel for conversations that we might not actually mm. be ready for. Like last episode when we spoke to Derek McManus, who used to be in the Star Group, which was like a, a tactical kind of operations group in the mm. South Australian police and he was shot 14 times in less than five seconds almost died yeah amazing story ouch doesn't really kind of sum it up it's yeah it, it is a, an amazing story uh, but he told us he'd already prepared for the worst before that ever happened the greater the risk the greater the planning there are still lots of times in my life where I go ah oh, I don't know about this one but Let's have a crack. Let's see how it goes. And there's very little risk management that goes into it. But the risk overall is very small. It might be that I will twist an ankle or I might lose $20 in a gambling or a, a betting situation. It's not going to destroy my life. And it's like, oh, well, you know, even if the worst case scenario goes, it's only going to be a hiccup. The more dangerous the situation is, the more planning, the more consideration we've got to give to it. And that's when risk management really comes to the fore. Most of the stuff that we manage on a day-to-day -day basis, we've done it so often, we actually go through the risk management in our mind without even thinking about it. It runs through the scenario of, I've done this before, last time I did it, it turned out well, or last time I did it, it turned out badly, but I know why it turned out badly, so I'm gonna do it differently this time, let's go. Now, when you go into a larger risk, you've got to start taking a larger look at how you manage that and possibility of being shot and injured, possibility of being shot and killed. That's when I sat down and had that discussion with my wife. This is a very serious risk. The impact could be catastrophic on my life and your life. Are we both prepared to take that risk? Do we have the resources to be able to manage it? Um, and if the worst case scenario happened that I did die, are we already in an emotional position where we have our mindset that it was conscious, we know what we were doing? Derek had planned ahead for the real prospect of getting shot and killed in the line of duty. Thankfully, he survived. Yeah, miraculously, he told us he didn't suffer PTSD from the incident. He actually puts it down to durable thinking, something that can be applied to any situation where we typically need to test the boundaries of our comfort zones. Now, this is reframing in action. We've called this series Reframe of Mind. Mm. And, you know, the concept of reframing, I think, is something that we should probably have a bit of a chat about, hey? Yes. <laughs> this episode, we're going to deep dive into the concept of reframing mm. and speak to motivational speaker Chris Helder, who shares his method to change his thinking and reframe situations. 
have to allow ourselves to be human. I, you know, I felt terrible about that. I felt sad about that. I felt sad about what I was watching happen. And I mean, I do joke. No one wants a sad motivational speaker. I mean, and uh, <laughs> and and you know, we're allowed to feel and then come up with a useful belief. And our mindfulness expert Annie Harvey shares her practical tips to reframe our thoughts around situations that are out of our practical control. I have to practice what I preach. That is the big thing about anybody that works in the area of well-being. You know, everyone will say, well, you you work in well-being and mental health. You'll be fine or you can't burn out or whatever. So I have to really try and practice what I preach. So let's talk reframing. Because we're up to episode 13. I don't think we've mentioned reframing yet, even though that's obviously was the most important thing to come out of everything for us, or one of the most important things, because we named our bloody series after it. <laughs> yeah, well, I think specifically, and here comes the reset, the 12 episodes and 90 years of combined well, living. I mean, also, we loved a less. pun and re... We did. Re, reframe, frame of mind. Get it? Exactly. I mean, if re- nobody's got it by now... It's, is it funny if it's, I've got to explain it? I don't know. I don't know. So you could go reframe of mind, as in reframe, or re, <laughs> as in regarding frame of mind. Anyway, I think Sally Goldman would love that because she loves a pun. Yeah. But let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> so the reset or reset of 12 episodes so far, 90 years of combined living in 30 seconds or less. Go. Okay, in our personal story so far, I've been gaining confidence after my high-profile radio job ended in Brisbane, and Andy's been learning to make better choices for himself that support his own needs, rather than making decisions for himself to please others. We're starting a business together at this point of the story, and we want to create inclusive programs that empower and inspire while amplifying voices that don't traditionally get airtime. Also, this part of the story that we're talking about is happening last year when we were recording these interviews to begin with, with people like Derek, and so some of the references that you might hear in things are a little dated because... You know, Armageddon, everything's at war. <laughs> the world's moving on at a pace of a decade per month, so <laughs> the, there you have it. <laughs> the city I live in is underwater as we're recording, so time is moving pretty quick in 2022. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Not to mention the um, the invasion of Ukraine. Yeah. So, you know, we're very conscious that some of these references are, are dated in such a short span of time, but uh, they're all still relevant. Like an old coat, you know, you can still pull it out of the cupboard. <laughs> Uh, I got in early with the analogy. I mean, in now 30 seconds or less, we forgot to mention that for 12 episodes now, Andy has been giving us some of the worst analogies that... <laughs> oh, come on. You they, like the deck he, chairs. He makes them up. You love the deck he chairs. He makes them up you? and they don't make any sense. So what's I mean, this? Pulling out an old coat from the cupboard that you don't wear anymore? Yeah, because, you, you know, it's still useful, even though it's a bit dated. I know, people will call it mansplaining, but I just like to do an analogy every now and then. What's the coat look like? It's furry. It, it's long. You it's, can't, it's a long coat and you it's can't furry. You can't wear a fur anymore. I didn't say it was fur. I said it was furry. Is it covered in cat hair? Probably. Yeah, yeah most definitely if it's out of my cupboard. <laughs> <laughs> also, just want to say, back on the reframe thing, you know, like... <laughs> <laughs> the re- you're resetting the reframe already. I'm resetting the reframe. You know, like we've said, we've taken 13 episodes to get to the actual thing that inspired us to name it name a series after it and Derek's is an example of a great way to reframe something so he's taken in his case a conversation a conversation before he even got shot so a Mm. conversation he reframed a conversation before he had to reframe it he was pre yeah that's right he pre-framed it he did. <laughs> so just to kind of step back to how he did that there, like he, he had the conversation which would ordinarily make somebody sad or, or depressed or even fearful to think about, I could get killed in this job. But he reframed that conversation to something useful for himself because it meant that he could plan ahead for it because it might happen. Yeah, so Derek's story is that extreme example of something that can go wrong. But most of us don't have to think about the prospect of getting killed when at work in the line of duty. Our particular challenges might look like something like starting a business. Um, For us, at that time we spoke to Derek, it definitely looked like that. Still does, by the way, the uh, the prospect (laughs) of income taking a long time to materialise. Long (sighs) time. A lot longer than we would have liked. Mm. You know, at that time as well, we were thinking maybe nobody's going to care what we have to say. That could be a thing. Um, It could be something like a paper cut that comes along and wrecks our day. Absolutely. And according to Derek, that's just fine too. My brother is a um, 
entrepreneurial type person he's run his own business he's now general manager of an air conditioning company and i laugh riley because he says derek i don't care how many risks you take and how much pain you went through when you got shot if i get a paper cut in the office i'm still going to whinge about it because it damn well works <laughs> so it, it kind of puts it in perspective and and i i completely respect that and that puts in perspective for everybody else as well people go oh my gosh after hearing what you've been through what i'm going through is nothing no no what you are going through is still significant for your life and you know i've been shot many times and and got through that pain but if i twist my ankle or hurt my thumb i still feel the pain and it still troubles me you know 24 7 until that pain is gone so everything has to be put in perspective of how it's affecting your life at the moment and we've got to deal with that at their stage of reality and and give it credence and and deal with it just the same as my brother deals with his paper cuts he would probably hate me if he ever hears me talking about his paper cuts like this <laughs> um but he but he very consciously said it and he said it in front of lots of other people because he likes to make fun of me as well but the reality is that stolen book for that child is their reality and the same process has worked for that child has worked for the fighter pilots has worked for you and your podcasts has worked for me and my business now it, it is a universal thing so stepping back 12 months our worst case scenario has happened no harp this time we said we said we're not we, going to throw back to too many premie- we're not going to throw back to too many previous episodes because people might be listening to this the first time so it could be <laughs> we're only allowed one throwback an episode and we just had it no more fair enough all right no more and to be honest harpo has left me so that's the cat He's- and again if they didn't hear the previous episode they don't know you have a cat called harpo there are 12 to choose from go back and listen today <laughs> <laughs> and that's how you cross promote. We'll start a bingo card. <laughs> what can you hear in the background of our episodes? Is it a cat meowing? Is it a dog barking? Will Andy make an analogy in the first 10 minutes of the episode? <laughs> so, 12 months ago. Look, for all intents and purposes, it could be 7,000 years if the way people are describing like events at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> it, it feels like it happened in 1970. Um, it does. Yeah, it really does. Before either Before of us were born. <laughs> we were born. It has been a long 12 months. We would say, I suppose, our worst case scenario happened. Uh, we hmm. started our business. We started producing and publishing a podcast called Elevating Experts, which was something we designed as, a, I reckon, a sales magnet. So we thought if we help teach people some of the skills that you know they need in podcasting, we might attract clients who want to work with people to make podcasts. Almost like a bit of a portfolio and an invitation to come and work with us. And, you know, we think the episodes are fabulous and we're just Hmm. as funny on there if we're not talking about mental health, but we're talking about how to organise your business and write content. Um, Did it work? Hmm. Yeah, we had some exciting moments. Sometimes we'd log in and go, oh, we had this many listeners the last week and, you know, the numbers were there. But uh, (laughs) but then our podcast provider decided to rejig the way they download the numbers and what was looking quite promising suddenly looked untenable and um, when i say that it looks completely completely bottomless yes. and not in a good way and then we changed podcast providers after that for this one we did we did so we love acast yeah well they can pay us for that sponsor now. us acast um <laughs> we released elevating experts just after we had been speaking to hugh kearns from episode nine because he mm-hmm. called us out and said that we needed to take action because we were experiencing our own imposter syndrome um because we had had when we spoke to hugh kearns we had what did we have like 14 episodes sitting there ready to release and we hadn't tucked away ready to release exactly yeah because if we put them out there and people don't like them that's the worst case scenario we put them out there and we don't get any clients we've done all this work for nothing we were showcasing our skills as content creators Mm -hmm. we were hoping to get some business and you know the strategies we employed with all of the work that goes into it I mean, we've joked about it being the most um, expensive hobby in the world. It was basically like a full-time job creating it with zero income. There were one or two potential customers at one point. Uh, Yep, but uh, they ended up ghosting us very early in the piece. (laughs) (laughs) And uh, we keep putting them... Hello, ghost dog. We keep putting them in our OneNote uh, as ghosts. We... There's this image of a ghost dog that Andy found once and it's literally a dog with a sheet over its face and it's got two (laughs) eye holes cut out. I think it's like a Halloween costume and every time someone ghosted us next to their stuff in our one note, we just put this big picture of ghost dog. Ghost dog, yeah. And then then someone double ghosted us 
Like, <laughs> and then we found two ghost dogs together in a photo. Yep, and they got the double ghost dog. <laughs> I, I, I think maybe for copyright purposes we can't put it in the show notes, but if you Google no, ghost I, dog, I'm, I can no, assure you the images will pull it up. Do you know what? I'm pretty sure we can probably add the ghost dogs. All I, right. I think well, we can. <laughs> for we your can, viewing pleasure. We can probably add that. Um, yeah, but we're still but, here, uh, though. Have you noticed? Yeah, um, but this was 12 months ago and, you know, in our stories we were kind of still at the pointy end of of what landed us here in the first place, which Mm -hmm. is, you know, your career ending and my father dying and the family dynamics changing. So, you know, these emotional impacts were starting to bite us as well. And on top of that, very early in the piece, you know, our partners would kind of say, oh, you know, you're making money, what's going on, you know? And I can tell you that there is probably nothing more (laughs) anxiety-inducing He's not listening to this. It's okay, go for it. Yeah, then feeling like you're failing and then also someone, you know, not intentionally trying to call you a failure, but drawing attention to one of the KPIs you're putting yourself, mm. aka making money, and you're not making any. So that kind of, yeah, that, that kind of made me feel great. We had a couple of, like we said about our ghost dogs, we had a couple of really promising meetings with, you know, high profile companies, like everything seemed to be going mm. great. And they mm-hmm. prop them and it was like on the up and up. And I, at one point, uh, went out and said to my partner at the time, <clears throat> you can see how that worked out, spoiler alert. Um, <laughs> but had, the phrase itself, my partner at the time. Had a, had a really good day today. You know, we spoke to this person at this business and they're really keen and they, they're getting back to us. Oh, and I really wanted to, you know, talk about it and share that mm. and celebrate that win that we had, even though it wasn't a, a financial win yet, because it's the, it's on the way to the win, you know, you've got to celebrate those. And the first thing he says is, but did you make any money? And mm. that was really disheartening. And every yeah. time I tried to bring up the good progress we were making, those questions around money kept coming back. And that really does impact that self-worth that you have Mm. as a person psychologically because money is so intricately tied to our value. It's pretty hard to live in a modern society without it. You know, money's important, but also we were building something from the ground up based on a technology and also, you know, in podcasting, as popular as it has become, it's still very new. And even now, companies are only just starting to realise the advertising potential through it. And so Mm. we're working at that flashpoint of innovation as far as communication is concerned. You know, we're not denying that money is important. Uh, we'd be the last yeah. people to say that. But, you know, and again, it's not some kind of toxic positivity angle that's saying something to the effect of, you know, money isn't everything, just enjoy life. Yes, because tell that to the person whose ability to pay for even the most basic of things has run dry. You know, this is about how we're still tying our identity at that point of time 12 months ago to what we did and the money we made from it. So yeah. for you, you know, you were a leading morning show radio host on commercial radio. You led the surveys for almost eight years. And having come from an audience of 600,000 people a week to the prospect of nobody coming to listen, <laughs> it was gut-wrenching. It was really hard. I was there. Yes, yeah. yes. I mean, God, that was that was such a – that was a really prominent fear of mine that as, before I even left that job that if I – did something else that nobody would care, that if I finally dared to make things that weren't hiding behind anybody else's voice and put my values and my heart and all that at the centre of what I did, that nobody would give a fuck. And if nobody cared, then what was my worth and what was my value? If I wasn't getting positive feedback from somebody else, like with radio in the form of ratings or invitations to things or, you know, people just thinking in general, oh, that's a really cool job, like, or Hmm. having conversations with me. If that feedback wasn't there anymore, what was my value? Because I had tied my value to the job that I did, the persona that I had. It was all in there. Um, I mean, we didn't have no listeners for Elevating Experts, but it's a lot to go from 600,000 listeners a week to a grind for everyone, especially mm. the, the quality of the content that I was making didn't change. In fact, I think it got better. Um, but not having the power of an already existing media conglomerate to to push you, to tell you that you're there while you're doing everything on your own and still making the quality content, it's um, it's really hard. Like, it's really tough to feel like, you know, nobody cares what you 
have to say. Thankfully, we've got some distance from that now as well. And, yeah. you know, we can see now there was something else at play there because as much as we wanted it to be a success, we weren't actually telling anybody about it. We actually <laughs> figured that the program we were making was us telling people about what we do. But, you know, taking another step back from that, we needed to promote the show. We needed to promote all of that. So in effect, we needed to do almost this kind of whole push with promoting and marketing and publicity of the podcast, which we anticipated would show people how good we are at what we do to make them want to work with us. We weren't telling anybody about it. So, you know, it sounds pretty dumb on the surface, but, you know, think about all those times that someone might have called you an attention seeker. Or all those times that you've seen someone on the end of a tall poppy syndrome where they've got their got their comeuppance for having the audacity to have reached <laughs> the pinnacle of success and actually owned it. When we say we told no one about it is, I mean, we told Hugh Kearns about it and then didn't air mm. that interview with him for another 12 months. Um, <laughs> 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 okay, but we after we spoke to him, we did release it. I have built a decent Instagram following, you know, and if you're rich mm. in Instagram, it's like you're rich in Monopoly money. But there is a good community of people there. And to announce the launch of our Elevating Experts podcast, I did a post. It was one story on my Any Excuse for Fashion account mm -hmm. at 9pm at night yeah. in a badly lit car park that I filmed on the way out of the movies. Um, it's like, oh, that's right, guys. I'm running a business now. <laughs> Check it out. You know, we weren't, we weren't <laughs> posting. We, we, no. Okay, so that point in the story, we'd started our business. It was already at that stage, I think about seven or eight months since I'd finished up at the radio. So I did on my other Instagram account have quite a few thousand followers that were really keen on finding out what I was doing. And I've pretty much, I've, I've dog ghosted that account in the past two years. Maybe you can post a dog ghost <gasps> up on that feed. I think in two <laughs> years I've post. I, I went from posting like every second day to posting, you know, six times in the whole year. So And look, you know, I, to be fair, I think there's other stuff connected to that for you, you know, emotionally oh, well, that's back what then as well. That's what know? we're talking, yeah, there, there is that as well. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, look, with all the skills and experience, you know, 20 years in commercial radio, it's really hard to see why 2021 Louise isn't backing herself. You know, was it because she didn't really believe in welcome change media enough? Was it because she didn't believe in herself enough? I mean, do you want the answers on this lie detector? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so a good example of this is what I call the hockey story. Hmm. So in my first commercial radio job um, back in Inverell, it was a town of 10,000 people. So great place to be a big fish in a small pond. And, you know, being on the local commercial radio, that is big fish in small pond territory. That Absolutely. Is, that is huge big fish in small pond territory. And I was signing up for hockey one day. Uh, I was just joining a social team, mixed team, uh, casual thing. Um, I don't play anymore, by the way. People who play hockey are very aggressive. They kept coming at me with the puck and the and the mm, what is the broken stick. shins and I'm like, knees, no. that kind of thing I mean I enjoyed it but no I don't need an injury thanks <laughs> um, didn't sign up for that <laughs> just wanted to have fun, not have a broken ankle. <laughs> so when I was signing up for that, the person was taking my registration and they they, were, they weren't necessarily rude, but they didn't mm -hmm. they didn't give a shit. They were just there doing their job and just like... Tick and flick. Yep. Tick and flick. Next. You know, here's... Anyway, what what's your name? Louise. Ah, uh, what do you do, Louise? She's filling out the form. Oh, I'm a radio mm. announcer. You're a radio announcer? Ooh. Where do you work? Hello. I said, oh, I work for Gem FM, the... Uh, commercial radio station oh you're Louise <laughs> and so this person went from sullen just get out of my face let's get this done to her entire persona changing when she thought that there might be something special about me that and I'm projecting this onto her based on mm -hmm. part experience other experiences that she might be the beneficiary of Mm. And maybe in a town like Inverell, where you're a big fish in a small pond, it might be, might be notoriety instead of free tickets to go see someone. Might be a free CD. <laughs> Back in those days, it would have been a free CD. We did still have CD players. That idea of that recognition, that knownness, that was really intrinsically linked up with my sense of self-worth. Hmm. Because I did notice as well, after I left that job in commercial radio, we've already spent 12 episodes in what I call Louise Slams the Media. Hmm. Um, 
and this maybe this one is Louise slams the people who they interact with the media. Um, <laughs> oh no, 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 not not the listeners. I mean, like like publicity, for example. It's a very what can you do for me game. So I was really, I suppose, disheartened to see that when I was no longer in that position, that people who may have been my friend in inverted commas weren't anymore. Mm. When I was of no use to them anymore, didn't hear from them. Yeah. Think, not, um, all, not all of them, by the way. There are a, a couple. There's one publicist in particular who I think should form a part of a story in another episode because her invite for me to come and do something actually helped me leave the house for the first time in months. But that's how I had tied my value as a person to the job that I did and why the prospect of nobody caring what I make now um, was rough. <laughs> Yeah. The non-Cliff and, Notes version of it. And look, you know, like there's, there's a lot in there to unpack. And I think, you know, where we're going today as well is we've got distance from all of this stuff mm. now and we're actually making choices in accordance with our own values and what's important yes. to us now, you know. So, you know, years ago I attended a seminar and the facilitator spoke about, you know, anyone can do anything they want to do, you know. So it's that typical thing that kind of people misconstrue as, you know, those motivational speakers getting up and saying, you can be a billionaire. Mm. But it wasn't that. What she was saying, in fact, was that it all comes down to our values and the choices that we make are based on those and what we're prepared to do. You know, some might say what we're prepared to sacrifice in return for the goal. So an example that she described is anyone is capable of becoming a millionaire. So mm. to become a millionaire it takes a certain mindset, it takes learning certain skills, it takes certain activities and behaviours and that sort of thing. So when it came down to it, you know, you've got to make the choice, do I want to do these things so I can have that end goal? Some of those skills were of absolutely no interest to her as a person. So because they didn't appeal to her sense of what was important, she didn't become a millionaire. That's just yeah. kind of the bottom, the bottom line of that. I could still be working for the government right now as we sit here because before I moved to Darwin as you know I was in a government job mm. you know, it was by those the standards of those days it was pretty well paid even now I think it would be pretty well paid yeah. but I, I chose to leave it almost seven years into the job for a job in commercial radio I, I could have even stayed in the government job for an extra six months six months out of seven years mm. I could have stayed that extra time and I could have cashed in pro right along service mm. but nope I decided that taking the role in Dharma was actually going to have a much more positive impact on my mental health at the time. So there's a theme that runs through my life even 12 years back. <laughs> it was far more important for me to get out of that job that I was in than to hang around for a bit of extra cash than passing up a, you know, that opportunity of a lifetime. So when we think about success, I suppose the, the real question is how are we measuring success? Hmm. Because the measurement of success there wasn't the money. It was the way that yeah. you felt. I think, you know, if I'd made all of my choices throughout life based on money, I, I could potentially be quite wealthy, but Same. geez, I'd be a different person. <laughs> I'd have <laughs> lots of properties, I reckon, and um, I'd be like the Monopoly man. You would be like the Monopoly man. For a start, if I was making my choices based on money, I never would have done a Bachelor of Arts when I left school. <laughs> <laughs> Same. That's the first thing. Let's say, let's do science or medicine or um, law straight up. But oddly enough, though, you know what, though? <laughs> Just to step in there for a sec, sorry. Okay. I, that goes back to high school, you know, because in high school, I remember being very heavily encouraged towards the subjects that would get into the courses at university that would lead to the money. At the younger age, I was actually making those decisions because of money. But then by the time I got a month into my science degree and realised that it actually wasn't for me, it wasn't for me. I decided to do arts instead, and that was a me choice. Yeah, that reminds me of when I was at school, I had a huge interest in, you know, science and physics in particular. You know, when it got to year 11 and 12, I, I did want one of the subjects that I studied to be physics. Couldn't do it because I had to make the choice between to study physics, I had to also study maths B and maths C, and it took out mm. three subjects. And I also really love music and I wanted to study music and I wanted to study film and television and make things. Things. And so there weren't enough classes to choose from. Like if I Not enough hours in the day. <laughs> if I if I wanted physics, I had to do three classes to go with that. Um, and then mm. I didn't have room for music and film and TV. So I I chose the arts path. I chose that media path instead. Science would have made me a lot more money, I suspect. Maybe, maybe, maybe. not. <laughs> we know how that's been defunded of recent years. <laughs> 
<laughs> but I get your point, you know, like, and I would have, I, I probably would have done the opposite because I chose all of those difficult subjects and didn't particularly enjoy them, whereas I would have loved to have done things like music and history. So kids... Choose wisely. Follow your heart. I mean, That's just, what Uncle Andy says today. Just on my pedestal. Just a little on my pedestal here. Um, yeah. And, and I'm <laughs> bitching about the education system in 1998 or 97 or whenever it was. You know, all those art subjects that I did, I received at that stage, the grading system was a very high achievement, high achievement, credit and satisfactory and then fail, that kind of stuff. Mm. I got very high achievements in everything. So that's like your A++ stuff. And I know mm. people who did take the science path and studied chemistry, biology, that kind of stuff, the, the maths, and they literally failed their subjects and their OP was the same as mine. Yeah, so there you go. Fuck the government and their non-support of the arts because it's essential for critical <laughs> thinking and That's for expression right. of creativity. And if we had more people making more art, then we'd have less mental health issues. We would. And we'd probably have quite a lot fewer social issues as well. That's Louise's pet for <laughs> episode 19, 13. But the th- okay, 1997 <laughs> that happened. Has it changed? They're still uh, over not funding the arts. Look yeah, what well, happened I in mean, the pandemic. Completely, yeah. I mean, sporting gets all of the all of the money. Like, you get a lot of money for sport. And I once said to somebody, said, "Yeah, I don't want to speak too too ill of sport." And you know, but and she said, "Well, why not? They get plenty of money." And it's true. It's so true because when you look at yeah, people talk about oh, you know, they fund the arts, they fund the opera, and they fund the whatever. They're okay, so they are a part of the arts, and they are also valid, but. What we're talking about is new ideas and we're talking about people being able to create things in the context of the current world. So, sure, go off and fund your chamber music, which is lovely to listen to. I do like chamber music. Yeah, I do too. I also want society to move forward. I don't want it to be stuck in 1953. I don't want things to be clawed back and for laws to be repealed, which easily happens with the division of society that happens in politics. All the while, they're pumping more and more money into sports and they're anaesthetising the population. This isn't to say that people who watch sports are dumb. No, there's but a lot of there's a lot a mo- of good stuff that comes from sports. Yeah, yeah, there is. And we speak to some sporting people through this series. So I'm not shitting on sports at all, but what I am saying is that it's a mighty big distraction and one that doesn't require people to think too much beyond where's the ball. And have you ever tried to fill in a grant to get money to make something in creative arts? Those things are a nightmare and they're designed to put people off. Yeah, talk about jumping through hoops, hey. <laughs> I mean, I think that last hoop did actually have a ring of fire around it. I'm not going <laughs> to... It did feel like I was jumping through and getting scorched. There's my analogy for this section. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but look, I think, it, you know, just to pull ourselves back. To uh, yeah, because we, this has become another of Louise and Andy's Fuck the Patriarchy rants. Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, like, so 12 months ago, you could have signed the next routine contract in, in the job and you could have stayed in that job that wasn't bringing you any joy anymore. Just like I could have stayed in that government job back in 2008. We both made, made different a choice. choices for ourselves. Yeah, we could have made different choices for ourselves. We could have followed another pathway. Yeah, and look, and sometimes we feel like we're making a mountain of errors, you know, in pursuit of an income as new business owners, which is right out of our comfort zone. Yeah. And, you know, Derek McManus helped us to really kind of readjust our thinking or reframe our thinking around all of that. Human durability is the ability to go beyond resilience to sustaining optimal performance. A baseline model for this is I have a continuum that starts with fragility, has resilience in the middle and durability on the other end. Fragility I describe as when we are brand new at doing something, we do it for the first time, we're very young at it, we're fragile because we're we're new, we're inexperienced, we make mistakes, sometimes we break things. And if you ever have somebody starting new with you or you have a child working with you, we kind of understand it's okay for them to make a mistake, but we're not as generous to ourselves about the mistakes we make. But these people are fragile. Now with good coaching, mentoring, guidance, which we all need, we are able to take people uh, and we're able to develop ourselves from being fragile new beginners to resilient performers. Now, when we move from fragile to resilience, this is where we go through the stages of learning how to solve problems. 
okay I'm new at this uh, boss how do I fix this problem boss what do I do with this partner what do I do with this you know whoever it might be we're getting that guidance and we learn how to solve problems and that's what resilience is resilience is the ability to bounce back if something happens I know how to fix it I know how to bounce back and we get really comfortable with ourselves where we go doesn't matter what's going on if anything goes wrong come and talk to me I know how to fix things um, I'm resilient and and it's a very powerful be- place to be and it's important to have resilience in our personal stores but resilient isn't where we really want to be because resilient is always bouncing back always having to fix problems it's waiting for things to happen so that you can bounce back now if you remember there was a, a explosion in the port of lebanon 3000 kilograms of chemicals exploded and destroyed many of the houses and killed many people the lebanese uh, government and the, the media were saying the lebanese people they are resilient they'll be able to bounce back they'll get over this we'll be able to rebuild we will be fine there was one lady that was interviewed um, and she said I'm tired of being resilient I've been resilient all my life I've been through the wars I've been through and now I'm going to have to be resilient I don't want to be resilient anymore I just want to be able to enjoy my life Mm. and that I think is where we want to be and that's what I describe as durability durability is where we know that our performance is 100% reliable Everything we do, we know is going to go well. Everything that happens, it's predictable. It's We know exactly if this happens, I'll be able to see the signs. I'll be able to fix it before it goes wrong. It's where we're really comfortable. And if I make this analogy about these podcasts, when you first started running podcasts, your minds would have been going a thousand miles an hour going, oh my gosh, this is our first one. I hope it all goes right. Now that you're into it, I mean, talking to you guys this morning, it sounds as if you don't even bother talking about the setup. Oh, have we done this? Of course I've done this. You've got it all. You're in a place now where you come and do these podcasts and you just go, excellent. I know this is going to be fine. We've done this so often. We know exactly what's uh, going to happen. We know how to manage it. Everything goes really well. And I call that our comfort zone, our durability. We're 100% reliable. This is our comfort zone. And it's important to know where your comfort zone is and get into your comfort zone and enjoy your comfort zone. Because once we start enjoying our comfort zone, then we'll start looking around and going, I'm really comfortable. I'm not challenged. I want a new challenge. And that's when we'll take a leap from there and we will take on a new challenge. One of the important things about knowing where your comfort zone is, is that if you take a leap of faith and you take on a challenge and you crash and burn, many people burn back down to their basics. And we all know the term, you know, if things start going wrong, let's go back to basics. Well, basics is the day that you were fragile the day you started in this your place your comfort zone you're 100 percent reliably reliable if you crash and burn and you come back to your comfort zone that's when you start getting your confidence back uh, so back to elevating experts oh yeah it's been um, a long walk <laughs> it's been a, it's been a long walk um i would say gently it was a flop yeah it's, it's still up there. The content is great. There were listeners. There were people who reached out to us. There were, I think there are people that we were able to interact with based on that series that have become a part of our journey. But it ha- it, that series itself didn't net us any clients specifically. Yeah, it didn't hit our values. We were we were making something in vain to try and get a result where mm. we didn't consider packing it in, though. No. You know, we we wanted to press on because our initial idea when we started out, before I even said, let's make a business, um, it, it was reframe. It was reframe of mind, the podcast. You know, this is the idea that started the ball rolling in the first place. And you know what Elevating Experts was? It was, once we started our business, it was us not believing in our own ability to put our own ideas like reframe of mind out there and have mm. it be successful. And we thought we needed a backup to generate income in a way that was maybe more of that traditional model. I think we weren't emotionally invested in it because it was just more of what we would already living, what we'd yeah. lived before. It was another version of what we'd already done. Yeah. <laughs> to be honest, you know, was- like... <laughs> when, we, when we take, except there was no money. Um, so we took a good hard look at ourselves, as uh, one of your relatives told you to do before we started mm-hmm. the business in an angry mm-hmm. kind of way. Yeah. So elevating There's a story e- coming up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, elevating experts was something we made to try and make the money. We were basing our actions on what we felt like we had to do to fit other people's expectations. 
and some of those expectations from other people, from society, that we picked up and were living as our beliefs. And, you know, it's this program, Reframe of Mind, that is our passion. And there was a sense that, you know, we feel that Elevating Experts was the moneymaker, like you've said you know, recently, for our passion project. But it was the passion project that we intended to make work from the start. This was the program that fully aligns with our values and always felt good to work on compared to oh, days of making social media content and scheduling it up for our golden goose. That wasn't laying any eggs. And it all just started to feel like that old workday grind. Mmm, yuck. But thinking back to Derek's story and the theory around that continuum from fragility to durability, at that time with Elevating Experts, we realised that we actually weren't in a place of fragility. We weren't Mm. ready to pack in the business, you know. We just needed to change direction. We were in a place where we could reassess and just try a different approach, get back into that comfort zone for us, create that content, which is where our power comes from, then become durable and and, and try other things. That's the business though. Personally, some things were a little fragile. (laughs) Some things were a bit fragile. Yeah, 12 months (laughs) ago. A bit fragile. Um, Okay, so for anyone who hasn't caught up yet, my journey with this mental health podcast is after my dad died, I say in fairly glossy terms, the family dynamics changed and blah, 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 blah. Was this in the 30 second recap? Would we need an amendment to the 30 second recap? I don't know. Maybe we need a recap for the recap at this (laughs) stage. (laughs) Wasn't fragile when it came to the elevating experts flopping was definitely fragile when I received something in the mail from a relative um, and the relative related to this one who had told me you know in no uncertain terms to to back off to go away that you know if I caused trouble uh, what fucking trouble was I going to cause anyway if I caused trouble they would tell me exactly what my now deceased parents and grandmother really thought of me and my lifestyle don't use our kids as pawns don't even think of that All, all that kind of stuff that really you hear on fucking today tonight or a current affair you know it's one of those i was thinking jerry stupid. springer actually well no jerry springer would be like the episode where i'm sitting on stage and jerry says <laughs> we've got a surprise guest for you <laughs> and they come out with their cutlery <laughs> well cutlery i mean okay so context context, context of important. cutlery so context because because no one so. yet knows why we've been calling this person cutlery woman for the better part of a year as yeah. her nickname okay so so here's here's my story of shame and here's my story of um anxiety around the death of my father and you would think that it would be bad enough that my father died but when my father died he was in sydney where i grew up i mm. was in adelaide I was there when he passed away and I'm very grateful to have been with him in that moment. But also the pandemic was just hitting and all of those rules around funerals, we couldn't have, you know, X amount of people and all that kind of stuff that was going on with funerals. My partner couldn't come into state to support me through the funeral and through, you know, that time of initial initial grief and loss. Yeah. So, you know, you can imagine I wasn't necessarily in the best of best fragile. of states. Fragile. Fragility. Fragile then. Definitely yeah. fragility. So my shame around this is that as his son, I had to leave other family members to settle the estate, to Mm. tidy up the house, do all that kind of stuff related to preparing it for sales. So I felt really bad about that. You know, I can't change the fact that all of those circumstances contributed to to how how it was. Anyhow, not long after I'd left, you know, a relative pops on and basically says on social media what a great job the other relatives are doing in cleaning up the house. Passive aggressive. Passive aggressive. Passive aggression comes out. You know, I don't deny they were doing a great job, but it was literally a matter of probably not even a week after I'd left. So, you know, I took an action to just cut them off from social media because we never interacted on social media anyway so there was really nothing to be had there yeah. I guess to shortcut the story is that I think the flashpoint was really when you know they found out that they'd been unfriended even though we never communicated mm-hmm. on social media then the thing came in about you know you're this you're that and all of that kind of stuff so anyway it wasn't a very nice time <laughs> pretty triggering for me to think about it much less receive a lovely package in the mail which consisted of a baby fork and a baby spoon saying 
Andrew, I believe these are yours. So, and, you know, then the letter went on to, you know, basically saying, I don't know what I've done and can't believe that you're doing this and all of that kind of stuff. So quite guilt trippy, you know, in my opinion, it is, you know, weaponized love saying, well, you know, look, we're being very good to you. How come you're treating us like this? But there's a whole history of family patterns, which I keep alluding to, which, you know, will unfold during the series and not to actually condemn anybody who is actually been a part of that because, you know what, I'm going to put my hand up and say, I'm not above reproach myself. Mm. I did exactly the same sorts of things that I'm talking about with these patterns of behavior. And that's why I'm very intent on not actually identifying anybody because, you know, I get a sense that it's not just my family this happens in. I get a sense that it happens in friendship circles, in other families, in workplaces. I think this is a pattern of behaviours that's endemic in our society. And I don't even know whether it's a an Australian cultural thing or if it's, I don't know, you know what I mean? Like it, I can think for days about that. But what it comes back to is that at that time when I received that letter, I was really triggered. You remember, yeah, you were yeah, there. Yeah, you, you, were, know, I, you, are you all, That was one of the most upset days I've seen you on the on the team's calls. You, I could tell you you got it and you read it and you tried to play it off like it didn't matter. And then I could it just mattered. it mattered. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, no, no, let's 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 get back to it. Let's get back to this thing that we're doing. And I could just I could see it kept, was eating away at your mind. And then we had a talk about it. And then we had we Therapy had, Monday. You know, then we had, maybe that was the first <laughs> Therapy Monday. Maybe that was the turning point where we decided to put um, our mental health at the heart of the business. Because if, if, we, be. if we were in any other job that we had had previously, if something yeah. like that had happened and, you know, we had these self-imposed deadlines we were trying to meet to get things happening, we would have just gone, oh, I'll just deal with that later. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It doesn't affect, it's a personal mm. thing. Deal with that yourself another time. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. That doesn't you know, work. It doesn't work. You can't just get on with it because no. it's here and now and it's actually affecting you here and now. You've got to be able to give yourself permission to sit with it. You've got to be able to give yourself permission to to feel those emotions you're feeling because, you know, the more I tried to push that back, as you saw, the more they were going, uh-uh, uh-uh. And, and I got wobbly and I cried and I did all sorts of things and, you know... Should they actually listen to this episode? <laughs> they won't. Um, they won't. We we can block them from that as well, and then they'll have to send another. They'll have to send us a cassette in the ta- in the in the mail. <laughs> That's right, a cassette on a reel to reel tape. <laughs> But, you know, like, I don't know, like, honestly, if they did listen to this, uh, I, they need to know that I'm not affected by it anymore. That kind of stuff. I've actually become durable, is what I'm saying, because mm. that conversation with Derek, although instrumental in me thinking, OK, I need to actually find a different way to relate to this still, because, you know, I thought that I'd reframed it. I thought that I'd actually gone, OK, cut that off, on we go. But yet it, it kept coming back. It kept coming back to haunt me at three o'clock in the morning sometimes, or even just when I woke up naturally of a morning, be like, that would be what was living rent free in my mind. So these things we do need to keep persisting with, and we need to actually sit with these emotions because I'm not fragile now when it yeah. comes to that. I'm, I'm speaking about this and having a bit of a laugh about cutlery woman, you know, I, I can, I, I've got the distance from it, but distance isn't enough. I've basically been able to allow myself the opportunity to process the emotions around that and what they mean and figure out was I reasonable here, was I unreasonable there and you know I've done my own work there. So You I'm, were able I'm to happy. take a good hard look at yourself? I took a good hard look at myself which was the which was the command at the time in the fragile state I was in I retorted something and said I suggest you do the same you know so that's kind of the tit for tat kind of yeah. arguey kind of Jerry Springer type interactions that I don't fucking want that in my life. I don't care whether you're, you know, related by blood. I don't care if you are a million dollar client. I am not going to accept that behaviour. So now we've discussed that pivotal moment from Mm. our journey together and your journey in the last 12 months. Mm. Are you feeling fragile? (laughs) No. Not even fragile, not even the the long form version, not the uh, nickname. No, not even anxiety about talking about it in the podcast anymore because, you know, um, 
you know, like, like I've mentioned, like the, the points in between that initial letter and now has had other things in between and I was building up some resilience. Mm. It's almost like I was being trained, <laughs> you know, <laughs> here's another one. How do you feel now? Oh, actually, I feel a bit better. It didn't take me as long to bounce back and I keep mm. bouncing back. But now I'm at that point of durability. So yeah. you know, something's presented to me. You know, it might only be a skerrick of time before I bounce back. There's that, you know, I'm at the strong end of resilience with that now. And I'm feeling durable. Excellent. So, yeah, you know, like I've kind of reached a comfort zone within my place in that relationship and that I know that I'm making the best choices for me. Derek you know, would be I, very happy. He would be. He would be. Thanks, Derek. He would be very happy with that. Um, he did encourage us last episode to embrace our comfort zone. If you crash and burn and you come back to your comfort zone, that's when you start getting your confidence back. But not enough people are comfortable with their comfort zone. That's a very bad terminology. Um, they're, they're not uh, aware enough of coming back to their comfort zone is where they get their power from. Because when you're back in that comfort zone, everything's going right. Um, you're starting to get your confidence back again. Oh yes, I know I can do this. This is what I've got. Um, and so when we start out something brand new as fragile, we then move to resilience. We actually want to move to that 100% reliable. When we take that leap and we take on a new challenge, we've also got to understand that we will slide back along that continuum because when we take a new leap, there's new learnings, there's new things to problem solve. So we will slide back from being 100% reliable back to, oh my gosh, I'm just resilient now. And if it's a really big challenge you may, and you crash and burn, you may go back to fragile. But it's only in that one area of your life. The rest of your life is still good. Lots of people go, oh my gosh, I've embarrassed myself. I'm an idiot. My life is destroyed. People will think I'm useless. No, it's one area that you've made a mistake in. You are still a good husband or wife. You are still a good parent. You're still a good brother, sister. You're operating. You're, you're able to manage that business well. It may be your finances you stuffed up in. It's not a reflection on your whole life. And, and again, that's a, a nuance that a lot of people go, oh, that makes sense. So changing direction isn't always easy and it doesn't mean having to throw out everything that you've done. Sometimes a change of thinking or reframing of the situation is what's needed. So this in the journey for us is where we met motivational speaker Chris Helder. Now, hmm. we recorded this at the beginning of the COVID crisis. Yep. He had literally lost all of his scheduled speaking engagements overnight. In three days, I had like 80 presentations that just disappeared off my schedule. And it was insane. Chris Helder, based in Sydney, is a motivational speaker whose focus is on business mm. communication. You know how you go to those seminars and they bring in a keynote speaker and he gears you up and gets you ready mm. to face the world? That's, yeah. that's what Chris Helder does. Boom! <laughs> that's his catchphrase. Boom! Yeah. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I think he probably has helped a lot of people worldwide to communicate with their clients and their customers and their colleagues and their teams by, you know, teaching them some of his philosophies. Yeah, I mean, he's been doing this for, you know, almost 20 years now, mm -hmm. and he's had over two and a half thousand presentations worldwide. So he's not new at the game. So when we spoke to him, we wanted to chat about his philosophy for life that he's written a book around, um, Useful Belief, which is something that he believes can be used for anyone dealing with adversity and has the potential to open up possibilities and unlock opportunities for us. My idea of reframe is uh, this idea of useful belief. And I, I suppose as a speaker have gotten to be known for useful belief. And what's the difference between that and, as you say, toxic positivity? The studies out there really show that positive thinking, you know, is a band-aid and it doesn't work. In fact, the studies show when you lay in bed in the morning and, and try to be positive that you, uh, you're like, come on, Chris, just be positive today. You can do it. By 10 o'clock when something bad happens or something, you know, devastating happens that it's very easy all of a sudden. The studies show you actually feel worse about yourself than when you started. So you, you know, and you're like, gosh, I can't even do positive well. And I tried to do positive and really positive thinking and negative thinking are emotive thinking and my idea of useful belief and what really separates it is, is, is it's not emotive thinking it's practical thinking it's what's the most useful thing for me to believe in this situation what's the most useful action for me to take in this situation based on the reality that I'm facing so how do you get to finding that useful belief? Like, say, that example of waking up in the morning. How, when you're waking up, what are you reaching for? I would say, Louise, the simplest way to look at it is this. If it's raining outside, it's raining outside and you walk outside and you now are dealing with a reality of rain. So, you know, we now have a choice to go, 
I'm going to try to be positive about the fact that the traffic's going to be worse, and I'm going to try to be positive, or, or I'm going to be negative, which is a mode of thinking. So, but the simplest thing is, it's, it's, you can't say it's not raining. That's called denial. We all have bad things that happen to us, and we all have realities of our life. And uh, Well, geez, we certainly have seen a lot of that in the last 12 months. So you can't deny that it is raining. Instead, you say, you know what? It is raining. What's my most useful belief about the next 10 minutes? You go, I love walking in the rain. Boom. And all of a sudden it shifts your brain and opens you up. And, you know, it, it's useful thought, you know, useful action. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a different pair of shoes on. Useful belief. Uh, you know, I, I love playing football in the rain. If you're going to have to play football in the rain. And, and it, it is just a, a very simple shift of, uh, of mindset that is just about practicality. So is it as simple as just simply changing what you're telling yourself or is there a process that goes behind that to land in that position? The process behind it would be, I mean, I suppose the understanding that we have, I mean, every one of us has a filter in our brain and without going too deep into it, uh, it's called the reticular activating system and, and the reticular activating system, that filter that we all have, um, shows you what you see. So. Um, I, my 18-year-old my uh, son is now 20, but when he was 18, uh, I looked to buy him a car, and uh, a used car, and somebody told me, hey, check out a Subaru XV. Now, I'd never seen a Subaru XV before in my life. I didn't even know which one was. But guess what? As soon as somebody pointed out, go get him like a 2013 Subaru XV. Do you know what's on the road everywhere? Boom, Subaru XV. <laughs> Stay on everywhere and that so that's the filter that's your particular activating system and and it's no different if we if we believe these are tough times then your brain obviously goes out there and sees the negativity it sees the frustration it sees the angst it one of the sayings i suppose i've gotten to you know <laughs> to be known for is you know this is the best time in the history of the world to dot 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 whatever your situation is and i know that sounds maybe to a lot of people like what a tough sell in this you know global pandemic time but this is the best time in the history of the world to have a global pandemic and as soon as you believe that i mean it is right i mean imagine if we had a global pandemic 20 years ago what would you be doing no no netflix no phones what it what, like you, what would what would you be, no zoom meetings like what would you be doing you'd be sitting around 23 hours a day locked into your apartment with your nokia block playing snake right i mean it would have been <laughs> but we would have got very good at not catching the tail <laughs> well, exactly right the bottom line is people are sick and tired of being told to be positive and because bad things do happen, bad things have happened, bad things have happened to all of us. And when people come up to you and just say, hey, come on, be positive about it, you really want to just punch them in the mouth, right? That's not, that's not the answer. Hmm. It, it, it's useful practicality, prag pragmatism, thinking about controlling your brain. So it's quite a leap to, for someone you know, who might be listening to think, okay, well, my relationship is just broken up and you know my partner has left me with with the kids and i no longer have anywhere to live to this is the best time in the world to be doing this uh, how do you get from point a to point b so that that actually effectively reframes the the experience well, I, there's no rules on it i, I think you know it was, it was funny i was on the today show just recently and somebody said to me you know they asked me the question they said well chris you know, how, how long does it take to reprogram your brain? And I think even in that question, Andy, we're overcomplicating it. It's, it, it, it's, it's simply, you know what, what, what's the most useful thing that I can do today? Well, my most useful thing today might be to literally get out of bed, make myself breakfast and go back to bed. Right? I mean, it doesn't, like, mm -hmm. I, I'm not, there's, there's no rules on it. It's your life. And I think that's the big, I think that's the big thing. It's, it's, it's not this... I just have to be positive and go out there and, you know, you know, transform myself into some superpower, you know, that is, you know, the reality is that's not most people. And most people actually don't need to be transformed. Most people actually just need an edge. Most people just need a, a, a conscious thought in their day to go, okay, hang on. What's my most useful response to what my boss just said to me? What's my most useful situation? I'm going to do a little circuit breaker here and say thanks for listening to us. If you love the show, let us know. Hit the subscribe button on your podcast app and show us those five-star ratings. Remember to tell your friends about us and check our Patreon page for access to even more content, like extended interviews at patreon.com forward slash reframe of mind. The more people we get talking about mental health, the more supported we'll all be. Okay, so that's Chris Hilder, and if you've listened to episode 11, no judgment if you haven't, I mean, you're familiar judgment. with Annie. 
We just, we just but told you that we needed listeners. So, like, I mean, <laughs> we do. Come on. There you go. Come go on. Go back please. and listen yes. and hit follow. Um, but if you've listened to episode 11, you'd be familiar with Annie Harvey, who is our mindfulness expert. Stopping the cycle of stress, taking care is the T, which is around your relationships and depleting activities and that kind of thing. Inhale is your mindfulness. The first L is called listen. So, I talk about listening to your values and your strengths, your character strengths. So even though you might have certain things going on in your life, can you align your goals in your daily life with your what's important to you, what, what you want to show up for in life? And I didn't, I didn't know what my values were at the age of 50. Someone asked me on a training course and I couldn't answer the question. So I went down that kind of rabbit hole studying that. And then the last part is laughter. So Annie's book, The Still Effect... Available now. Just check the link in the show notes. <laughs> oh, you do that wanky radio voice so well. <laughs> Got a lot of experience being wanky radio announcer. <laughs> Seen a lot yeah. of them around that I can model my behaviour off. I'm sure you have. <laughs> um, Annie Harvey, she chatted to us about the prospect of reframing situations that are out of our direct control. I wonder if we can reframe any kind of inconvenience of being with other people in cars and situations that are out of our control, maybe getting caught in a commute or something like that. Yeah, so that's um, so I, I wrote a book about this because when I did my TEDx talk, people said, oh, that's a, the still effect's really great. Is there a book about it? And I was in my 50th year saying yes to everything. So I wanted to do 50 new things, but I didn't have a bucket list, so I just said yes to everything. So I said yes to the book. <laughs> and then it was suddenly, well, how am I going to write this book? I can't write a book about just 10 minutes or something I've just talked about. So I was, you know, discovered that a lot of my friends didn't want to learn the formal practice of meditation, but they wanted to learn how to be calmer. That's originally how they... So I wrote this book for 30 things that you can do in your day without meditating. So one of them, going back to the commuting, is what to do at a red traffic light. So, you know, we might be late for work and we might, there'd be a situation where we can't control when that light changes or how many cars go through at the light change. So can you sit and just really, I guess, go to your senses? So notice yourself sitting in the car, notice your steering wheel, look around, spot some colours, maybe notice the colours of the traffic lights and then it changes and you move on. So it's a matter of seconds or minutes and they're little, little check-in moments, I guess, in the day that people can use. And Chris Helder was forced into a position of having to test his own theory because when COVID-19 entered our consciousness, he needed to pivot his business, requiring a reframe in his approach. So the last uh, 12 months or so with COVID-19, I mean, you speak about having 200 odd gigs in a year. They all, I imagine, dried up overnight. And if your main job is going out and being able to connect with people in person, that also dried up overnight. For a <laughs> tough a, year to be a motivational speaker, Louise. <laughs> it's the best time in the world to be a motivational speaker. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. And, and we can let's you finish your set the question. No, I, I, yeah. So I'll, I, I'll, I, I'll, I, I'll, I was going with. So you must have reframed that because you would have found that it is the best time in the world to be a motivational speaker. So how did you take that situation and? You know, what's the steps of working through that for you to reframe that to this is going to work out for me? I'm really glad you asked that question because I think it leads us to that next piece that is just so important. And that is we are human. And, you know, I had actually I did a presentation in Adelaide and I literally I remember walking into the Qantas Club in Adelaide and I looked up and, and the National Basketball Association had canceled their season it was March 13 2020 Mm. Uh, anyway that was just the moment I knew because I think before that we were like oh it might be SARS it might be you know we're starting to give each other a little elbow here and there but 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 that was it and I knew and and I think it was something like not in three days I had like 80 presentations that just disappeared off my schedule and it was insane and the reason I think it's such a great question you asked me is I think first of all let's let's not not allow ourselves to be human too you know um we have to allow ourselves to be human i you know i felt terrible about that i felt sad about that i felt sad about what i was watching happen and i mean i do joke no one wants a sad motivational speaker i mean and uh (laughs) and and you know we're allowed to feel and then come up with a useful belief 
as part of a process. And I know, you know, Andy asked me about process. I mean, we are allowed just to go, hang on, what just happened is devastating. And as I said before, bad things happen to good people. And forget my situation, obviously what, what happened across the world has been devastating to, to so many. But I did have a couple of weeks that I really didn't know what to do. And I was um, feeling sad about it. And uh, I do joke that I people would come up to me and go, well, Chris, why don't you go read your own book? Oh, you're feeling sad, are you? Why don't you go give yourself a motivational talk, right? And, um, you know, so that is, it is, um, I think there was a lot. It is the best time in the history of the world to be a motivational speaker because, I mean, I think it forced me to really shift as well. And, and obviously we figured out how to do virtual and, you know, I did 81 virtual presentations and, you know, I think for the year and I, you know, I had one day I talked to the National Hockey League in Canada in the morning and I came back in the afternoon and did a conference in Beijing for Prudential. And I literally finished up that afternoon talking to six real estate agents in Western Sydney. I think they'd been drinking, uh, you know, and I had this incredible day where I like went from Toronto to Beijing to Western Sydney. And, you know, just it was it was actually interesting. You know, I had someone say to me, you know, through this time. Chris, you're going to be able to help people, and it may not be as much fun for you, but you're going to be able to help more people probably than ever before, but who are in real pain. It's not like just doing a conference on the Gold Coast where people are in the middle of a party, right? Where they're like, hey, we're going golfing after this, or, you know, yeah, we get, you know, we've we got a masquerade party after this at this conference. You know, th these are a lot of times people that are sitting in their apartments who are lonely and sad and and they are feeling those negative things and they're not in a useful frame. And, you know, I think to really say, yeah, Andy, this is the best time in the history of the world to be a motivational speaker, just purely because of the impact, you know, the impact and the feedback and the emails and the, you know, did I enjoy it as much? You know, I mean, you know, I love the stage and I love the live audience and I love the energy you get back from a real situation. I love all those things. They just weren't real, right? I mean, it just wasn't possible. So if it's not possible, you put your best face on it. What's the most useful belief about the situation? But having said that, I, um, it has been so fun the last few weeks getting back to, you know, some some really great live stuff and, and that momentum is picking up and, um, and the reframe was about really helping people through that time. And, uh, and I think that's even become a stronger value for me mm -hmm. on the back of COVID is it, you know, just service to people. I think with it, and that's not just as a speaker. I think every person listening to this, we come into contact with human beings and every day, whether it's dropping your kid off at kindy, let me ask you, did you make that kindy teacher's day better or worse? You know, when you went and filled the car up with petrol at the Coles Express, so, there's a guy back there who works in a box all day. Let me ask you, did you make his day better or worse? There's, you know, when you came across a customer, did you make their day better or worse? Like, you know, we all have the ability to serve others and, and help them and, and help them by, you know, making their day better. Useful belief, this is the best time in the history of the world to be alive. I think I'm about to blow your mind with something here because mm. I've, well, you've been, retelling this story made some connections that I don't think you've mm. thought about before and this is going to oh, be the cool this is going to be the first time that you've you've heard this oh wow okay you okay. heard it first with me come on um <clears throat> that day that you received the letter and the cutlery the baby fork and the baby spoon and I, and I could see how fragile you were and how it kept playing on you when I said no let's because you did try to play it off and mm. say we won't do we, it's okay and because then because that was my thing that's that's yeah. what I have been doing for all of my life. And then I, which I have to not do the thing that I've been doing all of my life, which is not actually wanting to find out how someone is when I ask them, because mm. I'm often felt like I don't have that capacity to, if you, I know that if you, if I ask someone and they give me an answer that I is going to require more effort, um, I don't always think I've got the capacity to to listen to that. Like especially with some of the mm. fragile mental states I've been. But in in this thing, I could see how much it was affecting you, and so I've put aside that feeling for me of if I ask him how he really is, and I say I don't think you're okay, then he's gonna tell me most likely what it really is, and. We're both going to have to look at these things that are triggering to us. Um, and so I think I put that aside then and 
called out your bullshit and said, mm. let's talk about it. A few times I think I had to reassure you that it was okay to talk about it. And it was kind of reassuring me too because, mm. you know, I, I didn't really talk about things. Like we've come a long way with each other in the last year. And it's like we've, you know, we were friends before this and we talked about things, but not to the extent that we do now. I don't actually think there's really much in the way of any secrets or any subject that would be too taboo to discuss. And as you started to talk about it, the thing that shifted the way you were feeling about it was humour. Hmm. When we started to make fun of it, the thing that struck me is how long was this person angry that, like, they didn't just send you an email. How angry was this person <laughs> as she wrote a letter angrily, found yes. an envelope angrily... <laughs> Got a stamp for it, <laughs> angrily, walked it down to the post in. office, <laughs> <laughs> added, added some cutlery. Like, how much anger and resentment do you have to have to fucking bother with any of that over being blocked on fucking Facebook? <laughs> but when you started to laugh about it, like, that demeanour, that, that changed for you. And I think... The, he, here comes the mind-blowing revelation. When mm. we've done Reframe of Mind, so far 13 episodes, and some of the feedback that we've been getting from people a lot is we're talking about things that sometimes are really dark and it's fucking funny. Yeah. Because if we can't laugh about these worst things that have happened, then we'll cry about them. And I think that laughter has that ability to just diffuse the pain. Yeah, laughter is definitely an amazing release. You know, Annie Harvey has talked to us about what a wonderful diffusing effect laughter can have. You know, laughter therapy or laughter sessions that she runs. It's literally, no one's even telling the joke. Someone's just standing there going, ha, 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 And suddenly the laughter picks up. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's a release. So, you know, laughing and crying are both amazing releases. I'd much rather laugh. The day you got and thank the, you for making me laugh. The day you got the cutlery. Here we go. Here's here's the reframe <laughs> of the reframing episode. The day you got the cutlery and you were in that fragile state and it hurt like a motherfucker hmm. and you chose to actually be vulnerable and share how hmm. you were feeling with me and I chose to be vulnerable and listen and hmm. then we chose to diffuse that with humour so that, and I know it still bothered you after that, but so that it didn't paralyse you for that day, we chose to actively find the most useful thing that we could do hmm. and reframe that then so that you could feel a little bit better so that we could start the journey towards getting the distance where you can talk about that and heal about yeah. that. And, you know, Derek talks about this continuum of fragility through resilience, through durability. I don't know whether there was a particular point where I started to feel like I was durable with it, you know, because, you know, there were other letters, there were other, <laughs> other incidents. Other pieces of cutlery. Yeah, have you got so, a whole set yet? <laughs> I haven't collected the set yet. I mean, but, and um, baby you know, forks. What the fuck? Are you, you don't have kids. What are you going to do? Are you sitting there eating your fucking potatoes on a baby fork? <laughs> olives. They're great for olives. What actually. are you going to do with a set of baby cutlery? <laughs> well, they are metal, I suppose. They're not plastic. But anyway, <gasps> by the by... Um, I, I don't know what, what point I started to feel because, you know, now, clearly today here, yeah. I, I'm speaking about it quite fine. I, I, I'm not triggered by it. I had some hesitancy earlier in making this series about talking too mm. much about my personal circumstances because we're all private people. We, we None of us want to expose ourselves. But I think, you know, in telling my story as well, people have said to me, that's happening to me or it's happened to me. And, you know, it's yes. it's good not to feel alone. And it is fucking great not to feel alone and you're not alone but sitting here today not being triggered by that event is an example of the durability in that continuum because you know those other things that happened in between that initial one where I was very fragile and the other interactions where you know I, I got a little bit upset but then bounced back pretty quickly that's resilience mm. right now I don't know like I'm not asking for it but should another letter arrive <laughs> should a should a plate it, and a bowl arrive to complete the set. 
<laughs> she had to pay you know, extra for postage to send fucking cutlery. It's not even a I large know, letter right? rate. Like, she, it was, <laughs> she was so angry, she had to get, what, a mailing satchel. But you know what? Wasn't important enough to express post. <laughs> But you know what? Durability is when the Christmas card arrived. I thought you'd go, <laughs> the Christmas eh. card? <laughs> well, the Christmas card, because so the Christmas, Christmas card had card. elements of the same patterns, you know, yeah. the elements of... Was that the one that had photos? No, that was oh. another one. Okay, so I'm going to paraphrase here. And the, and the card contained something akin to, don't know why you're doing this. I hope we can make the family great again. <laughs> Marga hat. Get it on a hat. Marga hat, yep. yeah. And, you know, child X made this oh, for child. you. I, I suppose, I mean, it makes sense, though, that if I've been warned not to use kids as pawns, I, I guess if anyone's going to use kids as pawns, it's going to be the people that, <laughs> that brought them up. <laughs> I don't know. But all of the kids are adults now. They can make their own choices. And I sincerely hope that the choices they make include busting these patterns that have been going on for generations in our family. I'm not blaming anyone. You know, these are things that we often go about with on autopilot. So but when you got to Christmas with that card, did you realise you were durable then? Yeah, I think I did because I looked at it and I read it and I went, huh, filed it away. Why mm. did I file it away and not throw it away like I did the initial letter? I'm keeping journals and maybe I'll publish a book one day. I don't know. It's, it, not because it, it's I like the hold certificate of authenticity for the cutlery though. So when we yeah. when we make it big and we can have like an auction somewhere, <laughs> you could like a Banksy piece, you could buy the original baby fork and spoon with the Christmas card attached. Limited limited edition one of one. <laughs> may or may not have been used by a child Andy. Doesn't remember because it's just it, the thing though, you're right. It probably wasn't even your fork. I don't think it was because I'm sure I've had conversations <laughs> with people from my family in the past have gone, oh, yeah, well, you know, mum got these when X was a kid or whatever. I don't think it was even my fucking cutlery. <laughs> <laughs> so she's on the way to the post office angrily mailing someone else's cutlery. <laughs> I mean, you know, as far as hobbies go, mailing random pieces of cutlery that may or may not have ever been... <laughs> owned by someone. That's a really good thing that you're in that state. Oh, you remember episode three, Understanding Depression and Anxiety? And we spoke oh, about, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so long ago now, 2020 has been so long. Um, mm. We spoke about some, for, personally for me, some really dark stuff in there, like, you know, around kind of suicidal ideation and ongoing oh. battles with depression. Um, mm. At the time, something that we said was, we feel like we can talk about this now because we got the distance from it. Mm -hmm. um, what you're describing there with, one day you wake up, I suppose, and realise that that thing that once was a trigger is no longer a trigger. That's a similar feeling for me in that situation, you know, like for a long time. Mm. After that, I was really afraid of slipping back into this depression again. Because when you're on the way up and out of it, you haven't got the distance from it. You're afraid you're going to slide back into it. I also want to add, you know, like, as you say, like some distance has gone on in between there and say that it's not distance alone that has yeah. I, I believe contributed to that that durable state because it's linked to my values it's linked also to my self-worth and my feeling of self-worth and within all of that like in those in those fragile days when I got upset when I received that initial letter I was still in a state of oh look you know I'm gonna be so upset that I'm not talking to blah, 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 or blah, 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 yeah. or, you know, all of this kind of stuff. And, and the shame, you know, I, and feeling the shame that, sh the shame that you've spoke about, that's, it's huge. Yeah, yeah. That is, a, um, that is a, a huge emotion that puts so much pressure on us. That is you attacking you. Yeah, completely. So, so in between then and now, this, this sense of waking up one day and feeling durable, a part of that is me saying to myself, actually, you don't deserve to be treated like that. This isn't an isolated experience and you don't need to put up with that open bracket anymore, close bracket, but I should never have had to have put up with that. What you're talking about there of realising that your self-worth needed to change, you were worth yeah. more, you reframed that for yourself. I did, yeah. But was that reframe enough on its own? Did you need to back that up with action, more mm. work, more tools, instead of you just saying the words to actually feel it, to believe it. Yeah, because, you know, I've got choices in this. I can go and approach, you know, these relatives and have it out, as yeah. you know, people would say. But also I know that that's not going to change anything. All that's likely to achieve is a flashpoint of some sort. 
and we'll end back exactly where we were a year ago. Or it'll end up with me not honouring my own worth Mm -hmm. and just pretending that none of it really happened or none of it was really important anyway. You know, there's, I'm very insistent. I take responsibility for what I do and what I say and what I've done. I need for relationships to work. That needs to happen on both sides. Yeah. I very much had the sense that if I was to expose myself to that relationship again, then it was only ever going to be more of what it had been. And I wasn't up for that. I'm not up for that. I don't want it. I love my family, but it doesn't mean that I have to love their behaviour or put up with it if it's toxic. It's the great audacity of saying to somebody else, you're selfish what you do is selfish, you're not thinking about me. Hmm. Do all these things to please me. Be who I need you to be yeah. to please me. Yeah. You're the selfish one. Yeah. And the you know like fucking audacity. The fucking audacity. The fucking audacity. <laughs> you're yeah. the selfish one. You're the one who's letting us down because you can't be who we want you to be. I realise that I can't control their behaviour or the way they choose Mm. to look at a situation or life in general, but I can make a different choice for myself. It doesn't excuse them. It doesn't excuse their behaviours because that's still unacceptable. But I had to ask myself, how long do I let their behaviour influence the way I choose to live my life and feel about myself, you know? Like, I needed to assess the choices I was making and take responsibility for them. Yeah, and Derek McManus spoke about this last episode. He told us that when he decided to take up a career that put him in a high-risk situation, Situation, he had to consciously take responsibility for those choices he was making. I am the maker of my own destiny, if, if you want to look at it that way. And I still believe that applies to me even now. In my own business of speaking, my raising my children, my driving my car, we all make choices and we need to take responsibility for those choices. Sure, there's a little bit of luck that plays in lots of different things, but the majority of our life is as a result of choices we consciously make or try to not make because sometimes we just try to avoid it or live in denial but I am very aware that it's you know my choices have put me in circumstances where things can happen good and bad and that's that's an important one to remember too we make choices that have great results but sometimes people focus only on the negative ones that philosophy of now that we make our own we make our own destiny we're the masters of our own choices was that because of the incident or was that something that you already had as a life belief before that definitely a life belief before that so when i talk about taking responsibility for choices i went one step further again than what most people do being a policeman Everybody knows that we are in situations where we may be shot and injured, we may be shot and killed. Everybody knows that. But very few coppers actually talk about, I may be shot and injured, I may be shot and killed, with their partners and say, if these things happen, what's our life going to look like? So I put myself in a situation where I may be shot and injured, I may be shot and killed. And so when it did happen, I'd already prepared myself physically, mentally and emotionally. The emotionally is a very important one. But I prepared myself physically, mentally and emotionally for the choices that I'd made and the possible consequences of those choices. Okay, so when it comes to people's openness to trying out what some people might quickly jump to label as woo-woo. Oh, no. (laughs) No, no, no. no. I I have to to stop you here because we have to be clear that even though you're shitting on chamber music. Uh Uh-huh, which which I love. We fucking love our woo-woo. We're we not, do. We, we draw. Are not, we're not shitting on woo-woo at all. We, we, have, we have a spreadsheet and it has... <laughs> <laughs> we have a spreadsheet where we've been keeping our uh, daily and weekly tarot cards that we've... Which we need to update soon, actually. ...that we've pulled out for the last, you know, year or so to see if we're getting... Anyway, we have a spreadsheet. It's... <laughs> We have a spreadsheet for our tarot card <laughs> I mean, we love our woo-woo and you know how much I love a spreadsheet. So The two things together, it's just chef's kiss. Channeling the king of cups as we speak. But Annie Harvey was able to provide some perspective on responses across the different generations of people she works with. Do you find that there are different responses with the different generations that you work with? I'm thinking to a specific example with my own dad and... When he was alive, we tried to get him to meditate, um, and it was a hard no, but (laughs) (laughs) 
when we suggested maybe he'd like to listen to the relaxation CD, which was basically a meditation CD, he was okay. Absolutely. It's how, I mean, you've got to get them to work out what they like. But I thought that would be the case when I first started trying it. And I'd say my youngest client is four and my oldest is, uh, she's just turned 96 in Brisbane. I teach her online and she, oh, she's, wow. she's an amazing woman. She's actually a, a nun. So she's obviously done a lot of praying her whole life, but she really wants to learn mindfulness and meditation. So she's taken to it really, really simply. But I remember trying to get my dad to it just count to 10 a few years ago, and that was a hilarious conversation. <laughs> he, he counted to 10 in very angrily with lots of anxiety, so that didn't work. <laughs> so, so, yeah, dependent, you know, there's lots of, lots of little tricks, but I think they've, you know, we've talked about people coming when they're in crisis or in burnout to try and then go and find help. And I think that's why I like the prevention side of it. But We've um, left it too long by then. Yeah, but a lot of people that would come to my mindfulness classes are not quite in crisis, but they're not far off. They've probably been told by a psychologist or a doctor to go and learn. And that's great. That's wonderful that they all come. And that age group would range. Probably my, uh, the average age, I reckon, would be in their 50s and 60s. But sometimes we have teenagers in the room. And so it's they, they have a certain motivation for being there. And it's normally based around reducing anxiety or getting better sleep or getting on with my work colleagues or whatever it is i wonder with the um the stillness thing as well whether belief changing needs to come into this because i, I know with myself i have no problems with being still until a thought creeps in that somebody's going to walk in and accuse me of being lazy or mm. somebody does walk mm. in and accuse me of being lazy because there's something else to do do we need to tackle that as a part of this yeah definitely that's your own belief systems i guess and it's you know in the end is once you've done these It depends what you're doing in the stillness. I mean, you know, many people say I can sit still for hours as long as the TV's on or I've got a book in my hand or whatever, and Mm. that's great. But this stillness is with nothing, just with your own thoughts and emotions, and that's, that's why it's so hard. Chris Helder has an excellent example to illustrate a simple reframe, explaining how he changed his perspective about loneliness and how we can change our thinking on the matters that are impacting us. I really like one of the examples that you do give about how you come across people sometimes who try to challenge you on being lonely or challenge you on when you're traveling that you you don't have any company, that type of thing. And your response is invariably, well, I like aloneness. You seem to be able to get across that you actually, it's not about loneliness, it's about enjoying your own company. Is that something that you've always felt or something that you reframed? Oh, I think that's something I probably reframed. I think uh, Hmm. I I, I realized that I am. you know, travel was to where, you know, I literally most years would be over 100 nights a year in a hotel and, and, and getting to that reality, 150 odd flights and I'm going overseas and, 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 you know, people would always come up to me and say, oh, you must hate that travel, you know, you must hate all that travel and, and um, you know, it's funny how people used to just say that so often and I'd be like, no, hang on, I could change it. I mean, I live in Melbourne so I could, well, I could change it. I could just do Melbourne gigs and there'd be no travel. But no, I, I'm not going to, because first of all, I love it. And second of all, you know, um, you know I love pre- presenting. And, you know, so if I'm not going to change it, what's my useful belief about it? And I guess that's a really main thing for your listeners to really get around this. I mean, are you going to change something? And if you're not, and this is probably most important, I mean, ultimately change, I mean, change it. All right, go get yourself a, you know, van. Go, go get yourself a wicked van and drive up to Port Douglas and live in the back of a van, right? I mean, boom, you, you could do that, right? Change it. But if you're not going to change it, and actually a lot of times if you can't change it or people feel they can't change it or they won't change it, you know, I mean, there's situations where people are like, no, this is what I'm going to do because this is, I've got three kids and I'm going to, this is, it's not what I want to do, but it is what I'm going to do. So if you're not going to change it, well, then you only got one option if you really want to find the joy in every day, and that's to have a useful belief about it or change it, all right, or, or, be, or be miserable, right? So those are your options. So we don't want you to think that Chris's message is one of toxic positivity here. You know how we have a crusade against toxic positivity on Reframe of Mind. Yeah. It's actually about being able to find the most useful belief that we know we can invest ourselves in to help bring about a change we want. Yeah, but what about when we feel like we've got persistent negative mm. thoughts, you know, that's not easy to find a useful belief in there, I don't think. You not know? at all. Um, Annie Harvey has got something to offer on this and some techniques that might help. One of the things you said um, a few minutes ago is that we half of our thoughts um, 
every day are negative. I've never heard that before. How did uh, I, I, again, I don't know how they've done it. They yeah, I was going to say, how did they get in there and work that out? 47% apparently. And we have a thing called a negativity bias and it all goes back to that old part of our brain that's looking for threats, looking for something to go wrong all the time. And it's called a negativity bias. And there's a guy called Dr. Rick Hansen who calls our brain Velcro for the negative thoughts and Teflon for the positive. And, you know, quite often if we've had a a day where someone's told us 99 things that have gone well and one thing that's gone wrong, that's the thing that we're going to sit and lie awake about at night. Mm. And here comes me wanting an hour's worth of free therapy, Annie. Um, (laughs) So I have anxiety, an anxiety disorder, and I'm wondering if you have kind of tips and maybe some kind of secret information on how to make meditation easier. Because for me, I find it actually almost impossible to stop. I've found it easier to not meditate, but to do something that requires really low, um, I suppose, low focus, like uh, scribbling or something like that. But um, help me, Annie, help me. (laughs) Is it the sitting still or is it the not knowing what to do with your racing thoughts? I think it's a bit of both. And you know what? I'm not even, I often think, is, is it? Is it actually anxiety or do I have something else? But I know that's anxiety talking um, because I often think it's not that the racing thoughts are necessarily negative. It's just, oh, look at that. Listen to that. Here's this thing going on. What if I think about this, 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 this? Yep. Off it goes. And, yeah, I and I bounce my legs. <laughs> yeah. So, um, I mean, a Fix lot of me. people will say to me, I can't, I can't meditate because I can't stop my thoughts and Mm. you know my response to that is you have about 80,000 thoughts a day so the scientists will tell us I don't know how they've worked that out but say that's 60 to 80,000 thoughts a day and you know if meditation was going to stop those thoughts um, I'd be a millionaire and a miracle worker by now Mm. so it's more about noticing patterns of thought so your anxiety probably will be more about future and you know catastrophizing about what might happen in the future and then just learning to have a different relationship with those thoughts and being able to just notice them because we all think that we are our thoughts and emotions and through meditation you learn that it's a bit like standing behind the waterfall you can start observing them rather than just being in them all the time Mm. but it takes a lot of practice. You know, it takes at least eight weeks of sitting still for five or ten minutes every day to actually feel, quite often, feel any benefit. Most people feel benefit in the first few weeks. Eight weeks? It sounds um, like I've given up too early most of the time then. A lot of people do, yeah. yeah. And the, the basic practice is to, if you can sit, I mean, you can do it walking. Um, you can do it lying down. You can do it standing. You don't have to sit. You certainly don't have to sit cross-legged or anything like that. Just I do it lie down and then I fall asleep. Then you fall asleep, so do I. I have to to sit. Um, And the basic practice is to say that you're concentrating. I mean, sometimes if you've got anxiety, even concentrating on your breath makes people more anxious. So, you know, I would suggest if you're going to learn, you learn with an expert. But you say you're concentrating on your breath of just your belly rising and falling, and then you get distracted by most often it will be a negative thought because half of our thoughts are negative each day. And you just, you might say, label it thinking or label it worrying or whatever it is. And just labeling it, that gives you a little bit of distance from it. Mm. And then you come back to your belly rising and falling. And you might do that a hundred times in five minutes. But but that is actually what's training our brain and changing those neural pathways. And I think most people don't recognize that. They just see it. You've got to sit still and quiet and go into some Zen zone and stop your thoughts and that's pretty impossible. I tried to do a, a, a Buddhism one once where they made us sit on these little beanbag things for about 40 minutes. And I think I didn't want to be rude and get up and walk out. But I've, I've never, uh, when it was middle time, uh, tea time in between the two sessions, I've never ran so fast from a place before. <laughs> 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 I was just there, just listening to the sounds for 40 minutes going, oh, I can hear everyone breathe. Yeah. 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 yeah it's, really, it's really hard. So start off really small. Sit down or stand up for 30 seconds and see if you can just notice your belly rising and falling and keep coming back to that for 30 seconds. And once you've stood for 30 seconds, you can probably do another 30 seconds. Just build up from that, really. But where I, when I went to Thailand, I was similar to you. I wasn't sat on a 
beautiful beanbag I was sat on a hard wooden floor mm. and we had wooden beds and wooden pillows to sleep at night it was only for three days it felt like three years but it was only three days and it was quite funny because I didn't take any um, mosquito repellent with me because I discard- decided that I was in a Buddhist country and I was in a rainforest and that would not be good to take my bottle of DEET with me but I'm I'm English as you can hear and I have very fair skin and I was covered in mosquito bites within mm. about three hours and we were sitting meditating for nine hours every day on the floor mm. and it's quite a good metaphor for life because I wanted to scratch the itch all the time which is a great metaphor for the things that frustrate us in life Mm. and I learned to be able to be to not scratch as much I mean I definitely was but not scratch as much so um, but yeah it was pretty painful experience but it was also really powerful and that's what made me want to come back and teach this thing but for like five minutes a day not nine hours (laughs) (laughs) I'm happy to leave the nine hour ones to the experts Yes, definitely. Yeah. I'm guessing with wooden beds being a part of that equation, you're not one of the people who get the pleasure of booking the family holidays very often. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was a, certainly a one-off. I won't, <laughs> I won't be doing it quite like that again. <laughs> so for Chris Helder, how does a motivational speaker motivate himself? We asked him what's in his toolkit. I think it's just that conscious awareness when we catch ourselves say something negative. And one of the funny things is when you're like, you write a book like Use of Belief and you've got teenagers and I'll catch myself and I'll say something negative because we're humans. And and then it's so funny because the kids will look at me and go, well, that's not a very Use of Belief, is it that? (laughs) Right? And, and, um, and it's, it's so funny because, you know, what happened from the, you know, when I first started to talk about this idea about 10 years ago, but, and, it is funny that I, I sometimes put this little voice into it as well. Well, that's not a very useful belief, is it, Chris? And, and so it's sort of become this little funny thing that I'll catch myself and I'll, I'll be thinking something negative and it is just put a little funny voice on it. I don't, I don't know. Well, that's not a very useful belief, is it, Chris? And, and it just sort of does, uh, it, you know, again, little, you know, little reframing again. You can, it just lightens the mood a little bit. I have a little smile on my face and you go from there. So... It's, uh, it, is, it isn't hard. I think it's a really simple shift. And, and I think it's just a really, it's just moving to a place of consciousness. And then there's not a, you know, it's not right and wrong. It's just what's useful, what, what would be a useful way. I got to go to this meeting. I hate this meeting. Well, I got to go. So if I'm going to go, this is best time in the history of the world. Go to a sales meeting and yeah, open your brain up and you might see something. Annie's toolkit includes some practical tips for when our thoughts feel like they're getting the better of us. Yeah, sometimes things get caught in that loop. I I call it the anxiety loop where this like one phrase will play over and over and over for a week if it was something that, you know, was quite affecting. Yeah, it's it's called the negativity bias and we all have it. We don't all have, uh, we actually do all have anxiety. We don't all have an anxiety disorder, but we all have anxiety and I think not that I'm a Buddhist but the Buddhists would say would call it the um, first and second arrow so the first arrow is you know some physical or emotional situation that we can't control it's in our life and the second arrow is what we think about that situation and that create all that thinking about it so being anxious about your anxiety effectively Mm. creates more and more suffering Oh, there's no worse feeling than feeling bad that you feel bad. <laughs> that one gets me all the time. Yeah. yeah. And you've probably, I mean, I'm sure you've been told, taught some breathing techniques. Yes. You? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And that's, again, why laughter is good, because one of the techniques that a, a psychologist would teach is four, seven, eight breathing. And I, I often, when I'm stressed, I don't remember the middle number. So I remember <laughs> the, the four and the eight or the double breathing. So you're exhaling for lo- twice as long as you're inhaling, and it could be three, six, five, ten, it doesn't really matter. And that's hacking into our nervous system and turning off our stress response. And laughter actually does that naturally. So if we're laughing, if we have got a big belly laugh going on, we're actually exhaling much longer than we're inhaling. So it's got a double whammy to it. I noticed a few times in this conversation you've said that you um, kind of look at the things that you're saying out loud about Uh, yourself about situations and try and rephrase and uh, reframe those when you're doing it is that really conscious top of mind every conversation you have every day no because that's exhausting but (laughs) but i will often look back on the day and i journal quite a lot so i'd look back on a situation 
I think the best thing I've been taught recently by a great friend is when you are, and again, you need some self-awareness. So when you're feeling a big emotion, and there's nothing wrong with that, that's often, most often created by a thought. So if I'm feeling anxious or fearful or whatever um, probably I feel that in my throat so that would be my first sign and I would say to myself in the moment I would say to myself what am I telling myself right now and that you know that, as you said that's that's another year of therapy because that's a lot of cognitive mm. behaviour therapy mm. but it's really interesting just to catch your thinking and what are you saying to yourself that has created that fear in your throat for example and then I've worked through that not, not in the moment necessarily but certainly journaling about it the night that night or the next day or something that's really helped i have to practice what i preach that is the big thing about anybody that works in the area of well-being you know everyone will say well you you work in well-being and mental health you you'll be fine or you can't burn out or whatever so i have to really try and practice what i preach and recognize the signs and it's okay to have a day in my pajamas now and again so now we've heard from Annie and Chris and we've got some things in our toolkit. Andy, I want to go mm. back to this idea of what you said about feeling shame at mm. receiving cutlery because that letter, the fork, the thing that the kids made, it was all trying to intentionally play on what would be To your, manipulate me. To manipulate yeah. you, yes. You're feeling shame about your role in things, like you've done something wrong. I'm, I'm just wondering what that piece is because... I really think that people can relate to this with, in terms of family because mm. of the weaponised love concept because we weaponise love. True love is unconditional. And That's right. But familial love is never unconditional. You feel shame and mm. that's your emotion. That's on you. You, I suppose. Yeah, that's can, right. That's my doing. That's yeah. your doing. You, They're you, not responsible for that. That's you can me. choose how you are feeling about that as best you can or, you know, that's if we take our responsibility for it. But they know you and know you well what enough are. Yeah. to know those buttons. And they know that by sending you things like that, that they would be contributing to that and not just contributing to that but intentionally trying to cause that so that they can manipulate a result that they want mm, while calling yeah. you selfish yeah because i think sometimes we really accept some shitty fucking behavior mm. from people who are related to us by blood because we think we have to. Because blood is thicker than water, as is commonly dragged out. It's not even necessarily by blood. Close if, relationships, you know. Yeah. The yeah. more closely intertwined the relationship, the more likely we are to accept other people's shit. Not, Especially if we don't have our own self-worth. Yeah. And not set you know healthy boundaries for ourselves. And we get taught at such... I don't know. It's, it's probably prevalent in everything that our worth is derived by the people around us you or mm. the things around us it's like back to that money loop you know if you don't make enough money don't have enough money you don't have as much worth or as much value if you don't have a job that makes the hockey woman go oh that's cool you're just you're treated like everyday scum we have these relationships with people so that we can it's like what can we get from you what value do you offer us? And so we think that we're worthless hmm. if we don't offer somebody else value. I think to come back to that shame thing is that we're probably conditioned as a society that if we no longer offer somebody value, then there's something wrong with us and it's our fault. You know, there, there's certainly that. And I've kind of had a, a lot of time obviously to think about my relationship to that as well and you know I've come to the place I'm currently at with that and also you know I, I talk about these family dynamics and clearly there's still more to the story because yeah. you know if I talk about a shift in dynamics it's not just someone saying to me you know I'm going to really tell you what everybody thought but it, it's about you know the, the change in the nature of relationships between you know family members and that sort of stuff that really kind of knocked me for six after the history of those relationships particularly so amidst all of that is an element of manipulation mm -hmm. as well with these sorts of situations because if you know somebody so well you damn well know what pushes their buttons. And that manipulation as well is someone else is trying to control you for their own benefit. It's, mm. you know, still looking for what value you can give to them because if you're not giving them something all the time that is feeding them, it's 
you've, you've got no value. You, 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 you need to be worth something to them. Well, it's the classic gaslighting approach, isn't it, really? Yeah. Well, look what you've made me do. <laughs> <laughs> look what you made me do. I wouldn't have talked so nastily to you had you not been like this. <laughs> I wouldn't have had to hit you if you weren't, if you didn't trigger me. Mm-hmm. That behaviour... Completely uh, unacceptable. 100%. But at what point do we reflect on ourselves and, you know, patterns? We, we, we have been talking about patterns, you know. Some of these mm. patterns existed in your family for a long time that, you know, I don't think that when kids are born, they're, they're not born hating somebody. They no. pick up ho- hateful beliefs from the people around them, you know. People, kids aren't born racists, are they? Like, they don't pop out like no, that. exactly. Um, we learn that stuff. We're all the victims of the conditioning that's come before us. But we also have the chance to change it. Yeah, we can all be the end in the chain. Well, I certainly am. <laughs> <laughs> the end of the family branch, as I've heard from a few episodes. That's right. <laughs> we can we can be the one that breaks the pattern. One of the things this series inspired me to discuss with my mother is that idea of childhood trauma, about some of the things that I felt like I went through and she didn't notice, I suppose, because for me it was trauma and for her it was Tuesday. Hmm. But then when she told me some of her stories from things that she experienced as a kid, I realised she had the same trauma. It, it manifested in a different way. And then she told me stuff that her mother experienced and she had traumas like that and she'd been experiencing them so how far back do these patterns go Mm. someone has to step up and and break it have to break the cycle and we all have the power to stand up and be the one that breaks the cycle yeah we don't have to angrily mail letters to manipulate other members of our family into doing what we want to do we can take our own responsibility for how we feel because it's about the only fucking thing that we have any hope of controlling Hmm. and look at our role in things look at how we feel about stuff Also, you know, success comes in many forms. A lot of people would say a broken family relationship is a mark of failure. Mm. But I disagree. There are plenty of circumstances that I've observed, not just in my own like circumstance, but there are plenty of times that I've seen where relationships have been unhealthy and that it would be far better if those people just didn't have anything to do with each other. This concept of just thrash it out and Mm -hmm. we'll settle it all, it's not always possible. And you don't have to continually beat yourself up to try and make that happen because we're all in different places. You know, we, we're, we're all on different paths through our lifetimes. And as much as we'd love to be everybody's friend and please everybody and be what everybody else expects of us, we're much more complex than that. And we- family relationships are much more complex than that. And they're not the perfect things you see on TV. No, we get sold this idea of unconditional love being something that comes from your family. Like, they'll love you no matter what. Mm. Um, nope. No. We're sending cutlery in the post. It's well, not, I'll tell you what's... what's that's weaponised love. Um, unconditional love does not look like, if you think this is bad, push me some more and I'll tell you what they really thought of you. Unconditional that's not love. That's not love. Unconditional love looks like you are where you are and you are who you are and I accept you and love the whole of you, regardless of anything else. Yeah. Even if you're in a place where you are unlovable, I still choose to love you. And that's not a short walk. No, that's not easy. How many times have we actually genuinely experienced that? It's pretty rare because... It is pretty rare. That unconditional love that we're looking for from other people, I don't know if it exists, to be honest. Well, you know what? It might have more of a chance if individually we actually gave ourselves permission to love and value ourselves if we make ourselves responsible for ourselves and our own happiness and we don't make it anybody else's responsibility what's left to post cutlery about (laughs) yeah i just think that unconditional love is something that we're probably all searching for it's probably at the heart of everything that we do we want to feel that way and the only place we're ever going to get that is from ourselves because other people are too unreliable and have their own shit going on so and why should it be your responsibility to make me happy it's not it's not your responsibility to make me happy but if you do hey that's good for me but it's my responsibility to be happy or to be accepting of all of my emotions wherever they are yeah to be fragile sometimes to be resilient other times to be durable other times it's 
I can't choose the behaviour that you're going to show. Can't often choose the circumstances. I'm sure that Ukrainians never would have chosen to be fighting for their lives in a war. Hmm. But I suppose the only point of control is that you can try and choose your response to it and how you feel about it and what happens next. And it does take action. It's not a passive thing. No. It is a never-ending cycle of receiving another piece of cutlery at a time every day and saying, this fork affects me less than this spoon did. And this, you know, the knife feels better than the fork. And then, you know, the bowl feels better than the knife. And eventually Mm -hmm. you've got a whole set and it doesn't matter. By the time you get to the mug, it's all good. So, um, did we just have a breakthrough? (gasps) I thought we said we did all of our processing before we started recording, but I feel like we might have hit on something really important. I think you you actually gave me therapy in situ. Live therapy. (laughs) Live therapy. Live therapy. Recorded for you. Um, (laughs) I mean, this certainly unlocked some food for thought, hasn't it? These interviews that we're having and that we're actually now sewing into our own journey... I just don't think the learning ever ends. You know, I think growth is something that isn't an end point. I think growth is something that's continual. Amazing food for thought. I mean, it Mm. obviously meant so much to us that Reframe of Minds became the series title. You know, that idea of us being able to reframe the way that we think about things, that we have the power of our thoughts and we can change that instead of being at the effect of our emotions. Yeah, look, we've maintained certainly up to this point and we will continue to maintain, Mm -hmm. it'll be a hill that we die on, that emotions are nothing to be ashamed of. But there comes a time when we definitely want to feel more of the good stuff wherever we possibly can. The thing is, though, Mm. reframing our thoughts is possible, changing Mm. them is possible. Mm. So why don't we do it? Mm. And we have the capability. We sometimes have the capability. We sometimes make the change. We do it in some areas and not in other areas. I suppose as a human, we have the potential to do it, but we don't. Yeah, it seems we kind of get stuck in these loops sometimes, you know, like the the story I was telling earlier about the male. So here's my spin on, mm-hmm. on that situation, because if I had simply chosen, as I did, to start reframing that relationship and my relationship to it and that kind of stuff, for the months that followed, I wouldn't have been waking up at three o'clock in the morning thinking, ah, oh, having those thoughts about... Yeah that situation or that interaction it wouldn't have bothered me that i get these little surprise things in the mail you know sometimes they don't even put their return address on it or actually they never put their return address on it and sometimes they actually use a printed sticker rather than handwriting so you know there's just that added element of surprise of the little you know it's a <laughs> it's an emotion, <laughs> emotion bomb. bomb it's a it it's, is an emotion it's bomb. a little bit of weaponized love you never know when it's going to explode in your face Oh, oh, a long time since something exploded in the face. <laughs> anyway, um, what I'm saying, though, is that if I was simply able to choose to just go, yeah, I've reframed it, I'm fine, move on. That's toxic positivity because, mm. yeah, I can reframe it. But the fact that I'm actually still coming back emotionally at that point and being triggered by something somebody said or something somebody did, it it tells me that there's something else going on there. You know, there's something pulling me back there that I also need, maybe it needs a reframe, maybe there's something else. There are so many tools out there to help us, right? It is entirely possible for us to reframe almost anything, but we need to make sure that that reframe isn't just sticking a big fucking Band-Aid over it and pretending it doesn't exist because Mm. it's only going to wake us up at three in the morning and keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger until we end up on the floor of the shower or worse. Yeah. Let's get down to it. Next episode, you know, why are we repeating those old behaviours and thought patterns? Why are we addicted to the old ways that we've done things? Why are they so hard to break? Yeah, look, it really got me wondering because here I am. I know that it's not good for me, but my brain insists on taking me back to these places, Mm. you know, at this point in time. And so I wondered, maybe like someone who has a problem with drug or alcohol abuse with addiction in those substances, I wonder if there's any link from a brain chemistry point of view in the way that our brain actually handles this sort of anxiety. So next time on Reframe of Mind... 
We talked to Marie Thiessen, AC, from the Matilda Centre to explore how addictions can grip us. We do get caught up in the shoulds. And as you were talking then, I was thinking, yeah, people feel like they should be able to get better or it shouldn't be like this. And part of the responding and treatment for alcohol use disorders and the drug use disorders is around helping us to see our way through those mind traps. You've been hearing our story. Now we really want to hear yours. Connect with at Reframe of Mind on Instagram, Facebook, TikTok and Twitter. Or connect with at Welcome Change Media on LinkedIn. You can also contact us via reframeofmind.com.au with your stories or suggestions for future topics. We'd like to thank today's guests for sharing their personal stories and insights. And for more information on any of the subjects, guests or references used in this episode, please see our show notes or reframeofmind.com.au. Reframe of Mind is a Welcome Change Media production. Louise and Andy's rants about the arts. (laughs) Who who are we going to shit on next? (laughs) (laughs) Coming up next episode... Andy shits on chamber music. I like chamber music. I do too. That wasn't that... my point. I remember one day at school when someone turned up from, I think it was from the local council, and they had all these trained dogs with them, and one of the dogs was jumping through the hoop, and it was like, here you go, fetch the meaty bite. And it's literally like we're fetching a meaty bite by jumping all through all these hoops. We're not getting a meal at the end of it. We're getting a fucking meaty bite. I want more than a meaty bite and I don't want the fucking rings on fire. That's going on the coffee mug in the merchandising when we sort it out. I want more than a fucking meaty bite. That can be filed under Andy's angry analogies. (laughs) (laughs) Analogies of anger with Andy Leroy. Makes you madder than a chamber pot. I've never heard that, as angry as the chamber pot. Is that a chamber music pot? No, I just made it up. (laughs) (laughs) Wow. Ah, so you're making up um, making up analogies. You're making up similes. As angry as a chamber (laughs) pot. As angry as a chamber pot. Ooh, that's angry. Wouldn't you be angry if someone kept taking a shit in you, though? Yeah, I would. I would. Some people pay a lot of money for that, but Uh, I'd be angry. I know. I read a story about that the other week. (laughs) 